Fifth Gear first saw the light of day in 2002, and it's been going like a train ever since. I love this. In that time, hundreds of stories have been told about every conceivable type of car and how well they do their job, sometimes under the most extreme conditions. So the team thought it was time to put together some of our favourite items from over the years and group them in handy categories. I don't want to come off the road. This time we're looking at super saloons and super coupés. Cars that can demolish continents in a day but still accommodate the family and their belongings. We'll begin our journey in 2005 with a machine that ticks every super saloon box in triplicate. We're about to test one of the greatest cars in the world. On a track, its acceleration is seemingly endless. The engine management system is more sophisticated than any PC. It's a four-door saloon that does 200 miles an hour. It has a spec that reads like a Formula One car, complete with a V10 engine and a seven-speed gearbox. It's yours for £62,000. This is BMW's mighty M5. Now, BMW have always claimed that their M5 should be good enough to carry four people and their luggage in comfort all the way to the south of France and at the same time be able to live with a supercar on a track. So I've been trying to work out how to put their claims to the test, but I think I've sussed it. We're up here in Salisbury, so it's a nip down to Portsmouth on the ferry, over to Caen, and then bomb down through France to visit a little town which has a street circuit I always dreamed of racing on but never did, Po. We were cruising south on Route Nationale 138, which eventually becomes the Moulsanne Strait of Le Mans. Perfect time to start experimenting with the 5-litre V10 engine. The moment we're in relaxed about town mode with only 400 horsepower, but if we just press this little button and we go from 400 horsepower of 507 and the whole engine tone just comes alive. The amazing thing is that this 507 horsepower doesn't actually feel that ferocious. They just feel this never-ending, oh, glorious surge without any real violence involved. It's one of the all-time great engines and to help you keep it in the sweet spot, they've squeezed seven ratios into the gearbox. There is a fully automatic mode, but I prefer shifting manually with the paddles. You also get to choose the actual speed of the changes by selecting one of six modes. Having driven the car for somewhat 100 miles or so and played with all these different gear changes, I begin to realise that although mode one, the slowest change, might give your passengers' necks a slightly easier time, you can actually make even smoother changes in mode six, the fastest change, just by giving a little lift of the throttle. Let me just demonstrate. Select third gear, build up the revs, up, lift, woof, through it goes. Didn't notice that at all. Well, blasting up and down through the gears, the computer tells me I'm only getting about 15 miles to the gallon, but then this sort of performance, that's not really that bad. But that means my range is only about 220 miles. So we've got a fill up. After another couple of hours, we reached our overnight stop at La Rochelle, where we suddenly realised quite how ordinary the car looks. Only a connoisseur would spot the telltale M5 details. But then, to the executives who buy these, the discreet styling is just as important as the awesome performance. Morning, crew. Hey, look, I want you to listen to the engine start up. It's a bit bizarre for all the beautiful sounds of yesterday, because actually on takeover, 
It can sound a bit rough. Hardly worth trying to beat his head until you just prep the throttle a bit. Another thing I want you to uh, look at is this heads-up display I've been using all the way down with a sat-nib. And it's brilliant because the whole route here, I haven't had to take my eyes off the road at all. And I think these displays will be a, a must-have for all the cars of the future. Time to go. Pack the camera away. Come on, let's get on the road. Considering that a Ferrari 575 has just seven extra horsepower and yet costs nearly a hundred grand more, the £62,000 M5 is a bit of a bargain, which makes it even more enjoyable. We soon got to Poe, and even the rain didn't spoil the thrill of finally driving round a track I'd only seen in old movies. After Monaco, it's the second oldest street circuit. And down the gears. Bum, bum, bum. But today, racing is saved for high days and holidays. So it was up the road to sister track Poe Arnaud for the final part of our test. Now, at the end of this pit straight, there's an amazing blind right there. We're going to get up to fourth gear. You just clip the one curve and it just throws you to the left one. And then the bottom of two right handers, which, if you want to have fun, can be taken as one. <laughs> Understeer there at high speed, all oh, with a snap of oversee at the end. Oh, this is a hell of a track. Down the second, to the left way. Ooh, silly bit, silly bit, silly bit. One way, and then oh, up the other way. Oversteer oh, on the way out. Oh, my wall! I think you could get a bit carried away. You have to remember the M5 is a big, heavy car. You've got to have a little bit of respect. That weight just throws the front out. And then, of course, when you're braking in long braking distances, you just need a bit more room. The car's slightly lazier in its reactions. The amazing thing is the brakes are holding up brilliantly for such a tight circuit. One more. Flick it. Power. Now on the throttle, then. Oh, backs out. Catch it on the throttle. Bit more throttle. No, lift off the throttle as we dive into the corner. To remember, I've driven this car. Oh. <laughs> Concentrate, Tiff. You've got to remember, I've driven this car all the way from England with all our luggage and the camera kit. And now I'm doing this to it. Oh, what a car! Oh, got a heart beating, that's for sure. Unfortunately, the waiting list is such that if you ordered one today, it wouldn't arrive until mid-2007. Moving on a couple of years to 2007, Vicky drove a slightly blunter instrument. Nevertheless, it still offered a lot of bang for your buck. Admittedly, going fast in a Vauxhall may sound unlikely, but this is no ordinary Vauxhall. They call it the Thunder from Down Under. It's the new VXR8. It's a replacement for the old Bruiser, the Monaro. It's based on their cheap and cheerful Australian muscle car, the Holden HSV. And I've got to say, I'm very tempted. Buy a similarly sized BMW 5 Series and 35 grand gets you a 3 litre engine with 268 bhp. With the VXR8, you get a 6 litre V8 delivering a massive 414 bhp. The question is, Where's the catch? This car 
car is Australian because it has no finish. Great fun, all brawn, not much brain. It is very easy to get it sideways when you've got the traction control off. Just turn the wheel, boot the throttle, and she just steps out. We have oversteer. Oh, you can't go wrong with that. Oh, sideways action. Just fantastic. And don't think they've saved money on the brakes. The four pot calipers on this thing supposedly stop it from 60 faster than a BMW M5 and a Lamborghini Murcielago. And after testing it a number of times, I can well believe it. Yep, brakes seem fine. It's built well, it's equipped well, it goes well, it's entertaining to drive and it stops well. So is there a catch at all? Well, the gearbox is a bit clunky and that badge isn't the coolest, but you can't argue with the cracking performance figures. 0 to 60 in just 4.9 seconds and a top speed of... of, um... hmm... The one figure Vauxhall does not quote anywhere is this car's top speed. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first official, unofficial top speed run of the Vauxhall VXR8. Okay, I've got two miles of runway, but before I get onto it, I have got quite a sweeping bend. So, I'm just gonna get as much momentum as I can on this bend so that I can hit the main runway on a flyer. So here we go. in fifth gear we were only about 500 rpm short so this car can go a lot faster than 155 miles an hour what a bargain for 35 grand however if the badge does matter and price doesn't then he could do a lot worse than the sleek machine tiff got his hands on in 2010 The last Aston Martin I drove made me literally jump for joy because the V12 Vantage is perfect, almost. Trouble is, it's a strict two-seater, so there's only room for one mate to come along for the ride. Now, though, Aston Martin have a solution. The Rapide. The latest Aston Martin is a four-door, four-seat, £140,000 car where metal looks more like muscle. It's yet another stunning model from one of the greatest British brands. All the doors have this clever swan mechanism which lifts them up as they open, which not only allows for an easier access, but makes sure they don't ground out on high curbs. Now, Aston Martin claim that the Rapide can comfortably carry four adults. Question is, for how long? Well, after just a few minutes back there, I'd had enough. It's good enough for going down the pub, but that's about it. Oh. The Rapide 6-litre V12 produces a warehouse full of velvety torque to suit its cruising character. It also produces 470 horsepower, plenty for the country lanes, but it means we haven't got as much power as Aston's out-and-out -out sports cars. The other thing we haven't got is a manual gear change option, so I have to use the automatic. However, as soon as you touch that throttle, it soon kicks down and launches you forward. Whoa. This is my kind of engine. No superchargers, no turbochargers. You can't beat V12 Classic Orchestra. But the B12 
biggest revelation for me with this car has been the ride quality. In order to get these extra seats in, they've had to stretch the wheelbase out. Now, normally that means they reduce the torsional rigidity, which takes away some of the sharpness of the handling. But the sharpness is still there, and yet the car isn't as stiff as a plank. Yes, it's got windows which raise further into their seals the faster you go. And yes, the 1,000-watt stereo alters its sound according to the number of passengers. But forget the luxury and refinement. Aston is still adamant that this is a proper driver's car. For me, the repeat is at its best when you forget about the seats in the back. Stop worrying about the quality stereo and ruin the hush of the double-glazed windows with a great big hoof of the throttle. There is, however, one small problem. The other new four-door, four-seat supercar, the Porsche Panamera Turbo, is £40,000 cheaper, more spacious, and the Porsche is quicker to 60. But despite that, we asked the Panamera to leave the premises. For once, I'm not going to be swayed by the traffic light bragging rights, because this Aston sounds better, handles better, and makes that Porsche look like a humpback whale. 188 mile an hour, means well heaven. And a chassis that renders you speechless. Dum, dum. Oh, really speechless. <laughs> Look, I can flick this around like a little tiny sports saloon. I am genuinely amazed at how well this car handles. I mean, this is nearly two tons. Flappy pedals. Doesn't change down quite as quick as I want it to. But once it has changed down, we're away. Just what you want. A little bit of kick and feedback. Firm, but not sloppy. Okay, some may say by a Maserati Quattro Porte. Okay, that's an elegant, wonderful sports limousine. And if you're going to spend your time in the back seat, it might be a bit of choice. But if you're sitting where you should be, up here, there's only one choice. Later on in 2010, we grabbed that same Porsche that Tiff had used in his Aston item and put it up against the Mercedes. And we roped in another couple of handy racing drivers to help test them out. Karun Chandhok is one of the new breed of Grand Prix stars who made his Formula 1 debut earlier this year in Bahrain. While Johnny Herbert is a hugely experienced Formula 1 veteran with 160 race starts and seven podiums under his belt. Today we've enlisted their help to find out which one of these two is the fastest four-seater. Karun and I will be driving this 97,000 pound Porsche Panamera with 500 horsepower from its 4.8 litre V8 engine and four-wheel drive traction. It's going to take some beating. But the 112,000 pounds Mercedes CL63 AMG that Johnny and I will be driving is even beefier. It's just had a facelift and comes with an all-new 5.5 litre turbocharged V8 engine with a growling 537 brake horsepower. Now, because it's rear-wheel drive, it's going to be even larrier. After a fitness test to decide which team goes first, that'll be me and Karun then, it was time for test one, Racing Driver Chicken, a game that rewards courageous late braking. The aim is to reach the highest speed possible before slamming on the anchors for this slippery chicane. Fierce acceleration is crucial to get to speed quickly. While the better the brakes, the longer you can stay on the throttle, allowing more time to gather speed. Whoever reaches the highest speed wins. And if you don't make the corner, it doesn't count. 
Karun and I will go first in the Porsche with a 0-62 time of 4.2 seconds and optional £6,000 carbon ceramic brakes. This should be a breeze. Are we there yet, Dad? Full throttle and... Oh, he's got toys on. We're away. Oh, that's oh, a toy. Oh, mighty. A bit aggressive now. Now, so you go as quick as you can. Whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. No! <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, I think that doesn't uh, count. Did I break a bit late, crew? <laughs> I think you might have oh. got a lot late. That was a fail, Tiff. <laughs> <laughs> Tiff, 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 Tiff. My turn next in the Mercedes. It's two tenths slower to 62, comes with similar brakes to the Porsche as standard. <laughs> and as long as I keep it on the track, it's going to win. Come on, baby. I think you'll find that is a winning run. The Merc had hit 81 miles an hour, three miles an hour slower than me and the Porsche. But because I didn't end up on the grass, it's a win for the CL63. For test two, we're giving the keys to our guests for a timed flying lap. Johnny and I will go first. Tiff and Karoon can brave the weather and watch from the side. Jason will slow him down. Jason's a bad passenger. Jason will walk steady, Johnny. He's a bit like me. Steady, Johnny. I hate, I hate being a passenger. Feels a bit dead in the hands, this thing, don't you think? There is no feeling, feedback at all. It's kind of got this habit of just giving you a right good snap. Not one of those. <laughs> we'll start the clock. He lift, did he lift it for the kink? Karen, you better not lift that kink. Should we find a bit of grip on the outside? This is where we had a bit of movement before. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's off again. Oh. He's going that way. He hasn't really shunted it yet. Oh, my heart rate's up. Yours? <laughs> oh, he's breaking late. He's yes. going for it. Spin, spin. There's no relaxer. Oh, in a oh. twitch on. Oh. One minute, 29. Point four. Oh, uh. I'm sure Karun can do better in the Porsche. I definitely think we had a short straw with that. Short? Oh, show them. Oh, stop, 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 stop. God almighty, you see me kicking around. It's sideways, but it's forgiving, though. It's drivable, you know? Can you hear anything? Coming up to Tiff's chicane, as I like to call it now. It's quite so happy for a four-wheel drive, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we're off again, we're on again. We're all sideways, will he go? Oh, oh. no. Yes, he's holding his, we've got it, and nail it to the finish. Oh. Ah, see, now that's messed it right up, hasn't it? One minute, 26.8 oh. seconds. Is that a win? Well, now, Garou, brilliant. Look at the stupid smile. Uh, I think place. you'll find that was a bit quicker than you, Mr. Herbert. You Very failed good. on the first test. Failed. Drive on, Karen, ignore them. <laughs> huh? That's exactly what I expected. So, which is our favourite fast four seater? Well, like me, Johnny thinks the Mercedes is too unpredictable when driving fast in the wet. This thing is just you're always you know, slowing down and then trying to get away. <laughs> Stop talking to me! <laughs> Where was I? Whereas the Porsche is more stable and easier to control. Oh, that's slippy. Oh, well held. That's good. And with a lap time that's three seconds faster than the Mercedes, the Panamera Turbo is the one we'd all choose. Even if it is Tiff, that's driving us home. <laughs> A year on, in 2011, Vicky couldn't resist a drive in the ultimate BMW M3 of the time. Remember when Harry met Sally? Well, this is when I met the M3 GTS. Oh, 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 oh. oh my gosh! Oh, 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 oh. oh lock stop! Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome! Oh. Excuse me screaming like a girl, but this is just so much fun. 
And it certainly should be, because the GTS costs, wait for it, £118,000. That's more than twice as much as a normal M3. How on earth do they justify that? Well, for starters, under the bonnet, there's a bigger engine, 4.4 litres instead of 4, and power is up by 38 horsepower to 444. <laughs> Then there's the suspension, which allows you to adjust the ride height and firmness and a roll cage to make everything much more rigid. There's lightweight plastic in the back here that replaces heavy glass and overall, thanks to a bit of a stripped out interior, there's a weight saving of 75 kilograms. <laughs> Now, just in case my first impressions didn't give you enough detail, oh. let me explain exactly how it drives. I'm incredibly surprised at how gradually it goes sideways. I really thought that it was going to snap and be much more vicious than it is. I can absolutely feel everything that's going on. This steering wheel is a brilliant size and covered in a lovely soft material. Everything about it is just screaming, I want to go faster. On to the throttle, nice tail out action. More tail out action and back the other way. Almost having a proper tank sapper on. <laughs> Still on the throttle though. It hits 62 miles an hour in 4.4 seconds, and BMW has removed the electronic top speed limiter of the standard car, so instead of doing 155, it goes all the way to 190 miles an hour. It's got a really raucous sound to it that makes you almost feel as if you're in a real thoroughbred racing car, because the back is stripped out so you can hear the exhaust a bit better <laughs> than if the back was covered in, <laughs> in rear seats. This V8 revs to 8,300 RPM and changing gear is done at the flick of a finger. Now you don't get a manual option and you do not need one because this seven speed auto is phenomenally quick. There is no way I would be able to shift a stick as quickly. So, has this car got any faults? No. <laughs> It is one of the best cars I have ever driven, and I will cherish this day. Oh, yes. But let's get back down to earth. This car is nearly £10,000 more expensive than its main rival, the Porsche 911 GT3 RS, a car that is also absolutely stunning. So, which do I prefer? That's a really tough question. I can't answer. If this car was a man, I would marry it. Oh, yes. Another car that went down well in 2011 was a Ferrari. A rather radical Ferrari. Forget everything you know about Ferrari. They may as well have beamed this down from another planet. Take a look at the front, and it's got Ferrari written all over it. But take a look at the back, and you discover Ferrari have built an estate car. Can you believe it? This £230,000 machine has four seats and a bigger boot than a Ford Focus. They call it the FF. So that's one F for four seats, but the biggest surprise is another F for four-wheel drive. It's their first ever four-wheel drive production car and has been made simply because their customers asked for it. Apparently, their clientele were fed up of having to take the four-wheel drive Bentley or Lamborghini to the skiing resort and they really wanted to take a Ferrari. 
My biggest concern with this new FF is that the four-wheel drive would ruin the classic Ferrari handling because almost inevitably it tends to put a bit more understeer to a car. Also, it puts more weight over the front axle, which a front edge of Ferrari doesn't want. Ferrari have gone to extraordinary lengths to avoid this problem, inventing their own bespoke four-wheel drive system that adds just 30 kilograms to the car's weight. You've still got classic Ferrari handling, sharp turning and great acceleration out of corners with good traction. It is glorious. As much as I love getting a car sideways, Ferrari's customers wanted all-round grip. And that's what they've got. Even round the endless hairpin corners of the Italian Alps, the FF stayed planted. And even with 600 horsepower, there's enough grip to keep me out of trouble. So, on the way to the skiing resort, the FF drives impeccably. But what happens when you finally get there and the roads are covered in snow? To find out, the Ferrari was taken to the top of the mountain, quickly. Welcome to fifth gear on ice. With no studs in our tires, this could be an accident waiting to happen. This is sheet snow and ice. I've got it in snow mode at the moment. But the car doesn't feel like it's been held back. I just feel like I'm the most brilliant driver in the world. The ride quality is amazing. The grip is amazing. The driving experience is close to heaven as you can get. Unfortunately, the track's so narrow, <laughs> you can't get this big Ferrari fully sideways without tail back in the bank. So better not do that. It's the very last place you'd expect a 208 mile an hour supercar to work. But the FF is as cool as, well, ice. But here's the amazing thing. I can now actually switch from snow mode into sport mode. And now, all the engine power starts firing up. The handling becomes more exciting, and yet still, the car knows it's on snow and ice. So it still stops me bombing straight off the road, but gives me a much more sporting performance. And it sounds like a Ferrari. I can't believe I'm driving a quarter of a million pound Ferrari on sheet ice and snow. Grip, grip, grip. Unbelievable. So there you have it. A Ferrari that can go anywhere. Oh, I want one of these. I want one. Tiff may have wanted an FF, but would we want either of the big brawny yank tanks that are up next? Because usually, well, and our cup of tea. This is the iconic Ford Mustang. In this 2018 V8 GT form, its 5-litre engine puts out 450 horsepower and gets it to 62 miles an hour in 4.6 seconds. And this is the equally awesome Chevrolet Camaro V8. It has a 6-litre engine, which develops 453 horsepower, and hits 62 in 4.4 seconds. Those statistics are bordering on supercar territory, rivaling cars like the Porsche 911 Carrera. And the good news is that both of these muscle cars are now officially imported into the UK, complete with full manufacturer warranties. But here's the real headline. The Mustang will set you back just £42,000. While the Camaro is even cheaper at 39 grand. Now, to put that into context, a closely powered BMW M4 would cost 20 grand more. There's just one problem. American motors are generally designed for endless straight roads. So, historically, don't have the suspension setups to deal with British bends. 
Which is why we're here at Rockingham, to find out, finally, if cars from over there can cut the mustard over here. We've got three torturous tests lined up. And not surprisingly, we're going to kick off with a bit of cornering. We've set up this tight slalom course, followed by these two sweeping bends to get the measure of the cars in slow and fast corners. Hit it! It's all on the stopwatch, and Tiff's saddled up the Mustang. This Mustang has just had a facelift, and it's got an angrier external styling and revised interior. But what I want to know is what it's like to drive, because the facelift has also brought an extra 34 horsepower. But I think it's going to need all the help we can get to get 1,743 kilos through a slalom. Three, two, one, hit it! <laughs> oh, I nearly stalled! I nearly stalled! A few more revs. Oh, he's biting, he's biting it off. Now we're getting there. Lip it through the third gear just to touch the brakes. Get on that throttle, get on that throttle tip, get on this understeer a bit wide. I'm out. Could be a 15. <laughs> that could be a 15, you reckon? That could be a 15. <laughs> that could be a 15. It's a 16.7. Through the mid middle section, it looks spicy. Although my estimate was wrong, the Mustang still handled surprisingly well. Mind you, this car does come with Ford's additional 1,600-pound Magnaride adaptive suspension package. So, like Tiff, my Camaro has been updated for 2018. In fact, it's 28% stiffer. But unlike the Ford, it doesn't have the optional adaptive damping control. And unlike the Mustang, my Chevy only comes in left-hand drive, which is an obvious consideration for British roads. But at least, like Tiff, I've got a manual gearbox to play with. And crucially, I'm 100 kilograms lighter, which could make a big difference in this test where change of direction is so critical. Three, two, one, go! Oh, that's not the best start ever. Pretty good through the slalom. This is the corner I need to get right. Oh, he's getting aggressive. He's getting aggressive. Wow, a bit of understeer. But I think that's probably enough. 0.23 slower than the Mustang. I simply don't believe that. I don't believe it. I thought you bottled it a bit here. No, I thought it was quicker there. Close, though. It is close. I mean, there's nothing in it, is there? So, the Mustang is one up. But now we're going to make these cars feel much more at home, because if there's one thing that Yank Tanks love to do, it's to go fast in a straight line. Talky V8s and big, fat tyres. I can't wait. So, we'll adjourn to our track's 400-metre finish straight. It's the best of three runs to decide which car can put down its 450 horses best. And I had high hopes for my Mustang, because it's got a nifty little trick up its sleeve. What you have to do is to get into the drag racing mode. Aha! Drag strip mode combines launch control with a softening of the rear dampers, which allows the back end to squat and maximise acceleration. Would it work? Well, I was about to find out. Press middle mode, launch control. OK, press that. It's got the look of an old man with a brand new high tech device, so <laughs> he can't work it out. RPM, OK. And whoa! Now I can go from anywhere from 3,000 to 5,500 for your launch control settings. Now, I've got none of that drag strip nonsense. What I've got is what you really want in a test like this, and that's more pulling power. Tiff's got 527 newton metres of torque, but I've got 617, and that's going to make the difference in this sort of test. Oh, and let's not forget, I'm the equivalent of Tiff and a kid lighter. Drag strip, ready to go. So, Noodles, have you set up all your gizmos? I'm gizmo to go, son. All I have is, is being able to control my right foot. Oh, dear. I can choose a launch control from between 3,000 and 5,500 revs. I've tried 5,000 for my first launch. Right. Well, I am ready. But what I've got to make sure is I don't get too much wheel spin. Because that will be the killer. 
5,000 raiders. I might have jumped the star. A, A, you jumped the star. A, you jumped the star. <laughs> It's not three, two, go. It's three, two, one, go. The go is after the one, right? <laughs> I was between the one and yes, the go. Yes, you were between the one and the go. Yeah. I'm going to try 4,000 revs. I knew it, I knew it. My Mustang was suffering from too much wheel spin at the start. Maybe dialing back the launch control would help. Ah, oh, 4,000. No, I'm going to go 4,200. About halfway. OK, I'd nip the starter touch, but I'd won by miles. So I'm calling that 1-0. Meanwhile, over in Stangland... Look at him, he's folded his wing mirrors in to reduce the drag. He's so competitive. Three, two, one, go! Well, we're away! That was a great start by the play there. Oh, useless. This is quite a bit quick. So that's 2-0 to the Chevrolet Camaro. I'm relying on launch control that's letting me down. And also, you're heavier, remember? But that's in normal four. mode. I haven't set anything up. That's impressive, eh? I tell you what, I tell you what, I tell you what. I tell you what I tell you. Give me one more chance, one more chance. I'm going to turn that blooming launch control off and same as you, just do a manual, manual start. Manual start, yeah. Okay. It's got to be right, better. Right. One more go, I'm one more go, one more go. Don't try and outrun me. Don't try and outrun me. OK, I'd already lost, but I wanted the Mustang to get a bit of dignity back and out-drag the Camaro at least once. Uh, have you worked out your technology yet? <laughs> I've switched it all off, but this <laughs> thunder doesn't count. <laughs> I'm taking you on, head-to-head, mano a mano. Forget the flipping launch which has let me down. I reckon about 5,000 revs, a bit of clutch slipping, get the revs up, get the power in, I'm going to nail you. It's going old school. Well, we're very much like we are in this one. Three, two, one, go! Oh, no, I've got too much wheel spin and he's gone again. Wow, he can talk all he likes. I am away. I tried everything and been thrashed each time. By any other standards, the Mustang is quick, but it simply couldn't match the Camaro. Yeah, it means nothing, what drag mean? racing. What do you mean? That means nothing. It's a test. One all, one all. It'll all be down to the track driving. It's one flying lap. Tiff's going first while I hang on in the passenger seat. So what do you think of my staying on board? Do you like my aluminum dash panel, eh? I do like it, actually. Nice steering wheel. The sound of this, bear in mind we've both got V8s, the sound of this one is a bit more muted and a bit more deep in the car. This is a better chassis. Oh, you mean you're worried I already, though? Already, you're yeah. worried already. Do I need to worry? Let's start the hot lap and find out. Here we go, let's on that shadow. Oh, straight to the change-up noise. Oh, God, here we go. Oh, it turned it a bit early there, Tim. Yeah, I like getting up on that curb. Bit of the exit. I never know how quick to go to this part. It's sort of whoa, 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 whoa. She got the move there, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a call I don't like. You've got to go in deeper than you think, oh. I think. Then cut back, then nail it. Not one wrong, I crest over there. Oh. Oh. God, we're all pointy. Do you know what it is with you Put in the car? Quick. It's all the noises what? you make that make that upset me. It's all your. <laughs> what have you had for lunch? Very mental. good steak pie. Oh. Lost a bit there. And look how flat it corners. It's amazing, really. The corner's beautifully flat. Man, I'm amazed how shoot. hard you're on the throttle. Oh, no, I can nail it. It's got good traction, hasn't it? Yeah. Everything's switched on. Like the gearbox, nice little stubby gear change. These Americans, they're showing the Europeans how to make nice cars. I'm in the understeer. They're safe, steady. I'd like a little less understeer. The nose doesn't quite get in there. You see, you're on full power there, aren't you? Yeah. That's really good. I'm really impressed with this. This good is good. Good fight, pedal clean. Oh, 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 you're oh, fighter. You've lost oh, a bit of time oh, there, kid. Oh, 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 oh. 
and the time to 23.1. So the Mustang kicks things off with 1 minute 23.1 seconds. Time for me and my Kamara. Let's see what I mean about the noise. It's more harsh in here, yeah. don't you think? It seems sort of... It feels faster than the Stang, but, it, but it's more fidgety. Not see, I'm not change. as committed through here and on the power. Yeah, you're not nearly as relaxed as I was, no. are you? You're working hard. Yeah, I understeer there. Yeah. The problem is that the only way to get it to turn is get on the throttle. Right then, JP, you're warmed up. Let's see a lap time in this. Come on. All right. Can you beat a 23.1? You don't feel too confident about it. As we head the line to... Right, here we go. Brakes feel good. You're staying in third oh, gear, yeah, then. third gear here. You're going to use the oh, traction. Oh, use your extra torque. We're good to use the track as well, Jace, not the curves. I know what you're car drivers are like. Now you're in fourth. Yeah. All feisty stuff. So you've got lower gears. There we go. The power there. See, I'm just under It's killing me a bit there. No, oh, no, I thought I'd bitten off too much right. there. <laughs> That's a stupid line you take. Oh, we've got the curve a bit there. Um, can you not buy one with a steering wheel on the right side? Because <laughs> I'm feeling a bit strange. <laughs> but I think... You're distracting me now. Stop, stop it. It hops and hops and hops. It's pretty uncomfortable. Oh, it doesn't like getting the power. No, I can't though. get on the power. I've got to feed in gently. Oh, come on, understeer. No idea. It sort of feels faster because it's sort of all hyperactive, oh. but... I've got a feeling it's not going to be faster. 23.1 to beat as he heads to the line and stops the clock at... Oh. <laughs> what is it? What is it? What is it? It's a bit what faster. Yes, much to Tiff's annoyance, I'd hustled the Camaro around over two seconds quicker... Wow! ..than the Mustang. In spite of feeling a lot more nervous on the limit, the Chevy's lighter weight and extra torque had beaten the better balanced Mustang. So, the Camaro takes the honours in our head-to-head. -head. But the bigger message here is that America is now building muscle cars that are not only huge fun, but can genuinely perform even around corners. Germany, watch out, the Yanks are coming. <laughs>